I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Will Rind, CEO of Granite Shares. Thank you so much for joining me online. Great to see you as always. Oh, great to see you too. Thank you so much for having me back. Of course. It's really nice to have you here after what's been kind of a wild week. We've had the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank as well as Signature Bank, and I think investors are really wondering about what's going to happen next. I've been hearing really for months at this point about the possibility of something breaking in the broader markets. And to start off, I wanted to ask you, is this that moment that we've been hearing about? Uh, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, you know, bank runs are something that you really don't see often. And clearly when you have a situation where you have not just bank runs, but bank failures, that tells you that something is broken. And you know, we've got to that point with, unfortunately, interest rates at 4.75%. Um, that's all it took uh, to break some of the, the banks here, including Silicon Valley Bank, which is obviously the 18th largest bank in the US. So yes, things are definitely not uh, all right in the world at this present moment. Yes. And just to back up a little, could you explain in layman's terms what happened here? Because I think this is a really tricky situation that people need to understand properly. Yeah, there's a, there's a, I suppose there's a lot of different nuances to it. But fundamentally, I would say that the reason for, in, in specifically in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, the reason why they collapsed was really a collision between deposit outflows on one side of the ledger and then assets on the other side, which were you know, treasuries held to maturity that were on a unrealized basis sitting at a loss. Um, so there were loss making positions, which when the deposits started to flow out of the bank, the bank then needed to sell those assets and obviously realize that loss, loss to raise cash and the two just didn't add up. And so it was a negative food feedback loop where the more seemed like they were in stress, the more the deposits flowed out the door. And of course, in, in you know, a banking system, if you don't have uh, enough deposits to back up your, your liabilities, then you're, you're bankrupt and that's what happened. Okay, thank you for going through that. So as you were beginning to talk, the Fed, we have these high rates. Of course, the Fed has been raising now for a year. So to what extent is the Fed to blame for these problems that we've seen develop here? Well, there, there are a lot. I mean, whether I don't think you can say they're exclusively to blame, but there's certainly a large part of the problem because it's not just about the interest rate rises, which of course that will get all the headlines. Um, and perhaps rightly so, but we've got to think about that this has been 10 years in the making, that um, we've had zero interest rates and you know zero interest rate environment. Again, the unintended consequences of that, and, and in one particular case relative or relevant, I should say, to what we're talking about with banks, you've clearly had banks that have developed business models around zero interest rates You know, in a quest to be profitable and a, and a, and a quest to grow earnings. Um, but those business models, while well, may be profitable with zero interest rates, are not profitable um, with where interest rates are now. So it's, it's not just the fact that um, we've had this you know, very quick uh, tightening cycle, which has you know, really put some stress in the system. It's the fact that we've had to live with you know, market or unreally, un unrealistically low interest rates for 10 plus years now. And that's created all sorts of problems in the system, which are always going to be difficult to, to identify until, until they blew up. I think that's important to know because you're so right that the Fed does get a lot of headlines. Interest rates are getting a lot of headlines right now. So important to go over. Now, I think what a lot of people are wondering here is, is this the tip of the iceberg or can this be stopped? And certainly we're seeing a lot of measures being taken by a lot of different parties to try and bring this action that's beginning to build to a halt. So what are your thoughts there? What are we going to potentially see next? Well, it, it's really difficult to know. And you know, clearly banking and the financial system relies on trust. It's purely, purely about trust. And if you have trust in the system, then the system can function the way it's always functioned. But the moment people lose trust, lose confidence, 
um, that's when things change. And I think we're going through one of those phases at the moment. Again, remember that if we go back to 2008, we actually started to see the first bank runs in 2007. Um, here in the US in August of 2007, the bank run on Countrywide Financial, and then in the UK later that year, Northern Rock, just to name two examples. So that was a year before Lehman Brothers actually went bust. Um, and we're obviously seeing the same thing happen today, where we've seen two banks go bust, and obviously three, if you count the uh, crypto lender or the majority crypto lender Silvergate Bank. Um, and despite the Fed's intervention, despite the Treasury's intervention, despite, in the case of SVB, um, the foreign subsidiaries being taken over, at least in the UK, by HSBC, at least on today's market activity doesn't seem to have calmed the market in the way that 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 uh, the one might think and the swiss national bank intervening with credit swiss you know as one example we're starting to hear that um despite that you know counterparties to credit swiss are demanding payment up front and other things you know to try and almost circumvent or perhaps not taking many chances um with that particular institution and the credit profile of that, despite you know intervention from from Swiss National Bank. So I think you're seeing that with the regional banks here um, in the U.S. That despite this you know big sort of promise of of injection of funding that we heard about yesterday, which drove the market north today, it's going south again. And um, again, it doesn't seem to have necessarily helped um, stem the the lack of confidence or trust at this particular point in time. And amid all of this turmoil, of course, we have the Fed having its next meeting next week. And I believe, you know, up until all this started happening, many people were thinking that we would see a 25 basis point hike. People felt pretty comfortable about that. Now, of course, that's been thrown into question. So what is your view on what we might see next week from the Fed? Yeah, I mean, it, just to kind of you know, riff off of what you just said, it was actually interesting that it wasn't just even a 25 basis point. Remember, people were talking about a 50 basis point hike because the last two inflation prints came in a little bit hotter than the market expected. So it seems like a crazy situation that we were talking about potentially raising rates by 50 basis points just a few weeks ago. Um, and now we're potentially talking about either pausing or even cutting, as some people are starting to talk about. Um, I, I, I personally don't have a strong view on what happens here. If, if I had to say, I think a pause would certainly be the, the most prudent decision at this time. I can't think of a situation in history, perhaps um, someone will correct me, but I can't think of a, a situation in history where central banks been tightening into bank runs. Um, so it would seem odd to me, albeit, you know, with 25 basis points doesn't sound like a lot, but the interest rates would continue to rise in a market environment where we are having a situation where banks are going bankrupt. Um, but you just never know with this time. I mean, the Fed were clearly laser focused on inflation, perhaps too much on inflation, um, and you know have not necessarily uh, been as focused on the unintended consequences of that, and particularly you know financial stability vis-a-vis -vis the banking system. Yes, interesting that you say maybe focused a little bit too much on inflation. I was going to bring that up and ask you, in the case that we do get a pause from the Fed next week, what are the implications for inflation? Because, of course, they've been raising rates now for a year, fighting inflation. They've had some success, but they're pretty far still from that 2% target that they're looking for. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it kind of depends on, unfortunately, you know, how you look at it, um, because I think the the sort of traditional fight against inflation um, at this point, unless a sort of dramatic turnaround seems to be over. Um, however, when you have a crisis such as uh, we've just seen over the last few days, if that develops further, then we're talking about a perhaps not just a recession, but a, a hard landing here, um, which, of course, I think would um, really hurt inflation in other words bring inflation a lot far, down a lot faster so you know the there was always the question with the with the tightening was you know would, would the tightening would we be able to tighten interest rates 
uh, enough to engineer a slowdown in the economy and a soft landing and not crash the economy. Um, and I think obviously still, you know, the, the economy has not crashed, so the jury is out. But uh, when we see these situations like we've seen in the last few days, um, it's hard now to not increase that probability that we may be looking at a hard landing here. It, it's kind of starting to feel more like that way. And I'm also curious to know your thoughts on the U.S. dollar moving forward. Where is that in this interesting situation that we find ourselves in? It's a really, really interesting one. Look, I think that, um, you know, strategically, you could say that um, the dollar has really almost reached its limit um, in terms of, I, I think when you think about the, the capacity of, you know, the central bank to raise rates, um, now I think that that's very limited. But also where you have a situation where I don't think they can raise rates in this environment where, you know, clearly the financial system is at stake. So although perhaps in a, in a you know, all things being equal rates or the price of money should be higher, than what it is today, the Fed's now stuck in this position. I think that strategically really restricts the dollar um, because clearly the dollar cannot reflect you know, the, the true either price of money or the true credit risk of the market um, because of that. So I think that's why you've seen gold prices go through the roof um, over the past few days um, and not just gold, but, but other precious metals as well people realizing that perhaps this is it um, for the dollar at this stage. And, you know, even though the natural consequence of raising rates would probably look like, you know, the dollar could strengthen, it, it can't happen because of the Fed being stuck in this situation between raising rates or fighting inflation and fighting a financial crisis. Yes, and interesting you bring up gold. Of course, we're dealing with so much uncertainty and gold loves uncertainty. We've seen it blow past 1900 this week. We're inching closer to 2000, it feels like. So I wanted to definitely get your thoughts on gold and the factors that you think have the most influence on the metal right now. And of course, where the price may be headed as we continue down this path. In, in my experience, really what what, what influences human behavior most at the end of the day is fear. And, you know, we can talk about the dollar and we can talk about real interest rates and we can talk about all these other factors that influence the price of gold. And they all are important and they do influence gold, you know, over the long run. But there's nothing that influences it more than fear. And what we've seen this week is fear. And that means that people have come out buying gold, you know, aggressively looking for hedges, trying to preserve capital, protect capital in this particular environment. And in those circumstances, that to me is just the most important role ultimately that gold has. It is that hedge. It is that asset of, you know, the highest quality with no credit or counterparty risk. You know, gold's not going to do a Silicon Valley bank on you. And that's important to always remember. That's true. And you mentioned the other precious metals as well. We might see interest spread over there. Are you starting to see that at this moment or is that something that may come further? And which of the precious metals do you think people might be most attracted to? Um, yes, I mean, we're, we're absolutely seeing that, you know, the price of silver and again, silver probably is, is always naturally going to be the default, you know, against gold or alternative to gold or complement to gold. But you're also seeing it with platinum and palladium as well. I think just when you get to an environment like this and people are looking for things that are real, things that are tangible, things that can't go bankrupt. And you know, that's where there's a premium on certainly precious metals, but we've seen some other metals as well, the price of copper, for example. Um, and so I think that, that that's the situation we're looking at. You know, the price of platinum has, has rallied nicely. It's a good story. Uh, as many people know, the market is in deficit, which does help from an economic perspective or fundamental perspective. Um, but, you know, right now, I think this is an environment where the price of gold is going up and it's lifting all metals. So as we've been talking about, fear is at the forefront of people's minds right now. They want to find safety. Precious metals is one place you can find safety. Are you seeing any other areas that people might want to go to as a safe haven right now that makes sense? Broad, broad commodities, you know, to a lesser extent. Um, it's not the same as gold because you have exposure to other other sectors as well, but 
it's not equities or it's not stocks and it's not bonds. And again, I think alternative type investments are popular at this particular time. You know, one of the things we have to mention um, that's you know, exacerbating this particular situation is people are also rushing into the treasury market directly. And you know, the reason why that's a problem is because the interest rates um, have been raised to the degree they have, people are looking at markets like the two-year treasury, looking at the 10-year treasury and realizing that they can get a lot more um, for their money if they buy those directly than putting money in their local bank. And guess what's happening? People are taking money out of the local bank and buying the treasury bonds directly, which is sort of further exacerbating the crisis. Again, another unintended consequence of you know, raising rates um, in the manner that, that we've seen. And so you know, that's another area where we'll continue to see inflows directly into treasuries as people park money um, in the two-year and the 10-year um, and beyond, where people can harvest a better yield than if they stick their money on deposit at the local bank. It's kind of an alarming circular motion that you're outlining there. That's definitely good to be aware of. Do you have any other points that you would leave investors with during this time? Because I think, as we talked about before, people are definitely looking at what should I do right now? How do I protect myself? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, probably the other thing, something from our business that we've seen interest in is our HIPS um, ETF, which HIPS, um, which stands for High Income Pass-Through Securities. And really what that does is pays about a 10% per annum yield. So it's one of the only places you can get you know, above inflation uh, yields at this particular time. And that's a fixed cash distribution every month. And we have seen obviously at these particular times, people prioritizing cash flow, prioritizing uh, income as opposed to growth. And so money coming out of perhaps some of the growthier funds that were popular over the last few years and now people are saying, look, I just want to prioritize cash flow. Defensive positions on the one hand, um, so utility, we don't offer that, but utilities, things like that have become very popular. They were very much out of favor of the last few years. And people are prioritizing cash flow just to generate as much income as possible um, in, in this particular environment. Okay, thanks for outlining that. That sounds quite interesting. The last thing that I want to ask you here is, you know, this has been a busy week as we've been talking about. There's been so much news flow, a lot of things for people to pay attention to. So for you, what are you watching? How are you filtering through all of the noise and making sure that you pay attention to what's most important right now? Um, I, I think, you know, there's not really much that's changed. You know, we clearly are in the business of watching the markets every day, um, which we do. And from that perspective, um, there's clearly a lot of information to digest, particularly at this point in time. I think, again, just to, to go back to the, you know, ultimately probably the biggest story at the moment is, you know, people will focus on the next Fed meeting, um, again, as being a guide to, you know, what to expect next. Um, and, you know, absent of that, you know, monitoring for the situation with the regional banks and the banking system more broadly um, to see if there's, you know, any further movement comment from the Fed, the Treasury, or anybody else, you know, other central banks, for example, other central banks around the world about, you know, how they're responding to this. Um, and of course, if it deteriorates from here, you know, expect to hear something relatively soon. Okay, well, thank you for sitting down today to go over all these things that are going on in the markets. I think this was really useful and hopefully everyone gets a lot out of your comments. Great, thank you, Charlotte. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network and this is Will Ryan of Granite Shares.